Listen, it's crazy that there's all these Christmas releases coming out into theaters, yet the movie we've gotten the most requests for is a Netflix original movie, and I know a lot of people keep comparing it to A Quiet Place, but considering it's based on a book that was written way before that one, even before The Happening, which is also very similar, and considering that nobody steps on a nail that for some reason was facing up... I'd say they have their differences. I was excited for this one because it came from the same writer of Arrival, which I love. That dude also did Extinction for Netflix this year. And did, did y'all know that they're making a live action remake of your name? I personally think Bird Box is a solid rent it. It may not be as dark as the book, but it does have Sandra Bullock and Travante Rhodes in it. Did you feel chemistry just at the table? <laughs> what you say? So I don't blame you for staying home. Let me explain. I know a lot of people just want to know where the monsters come from, so starting off with the mythology, I went in and I did my investigative journalism, and I found a direct quote from the screenwriter who reached out to the author of the book on how that was the first question out of his mouth when he got him on the phone, and the author's answer to where the creatures originate from was, oh, I have no idea. See. A lot of y'all always get mad at me when there's no answer to these questions. Like, I get that we want answers from a movie, but the truth is, a lot of these movies focus more on what the creatures set up and not from where they came up. Is everyone a fan of those type of stories? No, you know. I personally think that if you want to focus on a theme, having an origin for your story doesn't hurt, but obviously it's all about the metaphor. Luckily, the screenwriter did add his own little twist to the movie of his ideas of where they may have originated from, and all of that comes from a big exposition scene with Charlie telling it to you. They, they come in all different forms, right? You got the Akamana, you got the Barrio Devas from ancient Zoroastrian legend. You got the Surgot from ancient Christian occult beliefs that made pregnant women Encounter their unborn children as other creatures such as lobsters or spiders. You got the Hula Jean from China. You got the Puka from Celtic mythology. All different names, but the same thing. And what's that? The end of us. So while it's not official, according to the screenwriter, Charlie's crazy theories would be his interpretation of where they came from. These demons from different religions that are really all the same entity looking to prey on the fear of people. Plus, we already know Laurel's usually right. Bro, how you not scared of this, man? But obviously the big theme of the movie I got out of it was parenting and how unprepared Mallory was going into it to the point that it felt like she was parenting blindfolded. It's it's kind of clever. So it's it's a metaphor for motherhood, what's going on socially in the world. And I think, you know, we're kind of getting to that place where we're not looking at people anymore. We're all mm -hmm. very isolated. Yep. I'm very happy not to talk to anyone directly or make a call. I said, can I just text you? Can I just not have any human contact whatsoever and just stay in my pajamas in my bed and go shopping? So in the beginning of the movie, we see on the news that people are killing themselves when they see these creatures. Nobody knows exactly what it is, but it's like a wizarding spell that makes you see your most ridiculous fears and turns you into Zuckerberg. And that's when we meet Mallory. Her baby daddy left her, so she's kind of unsure about this baby because because deep inside of her, she's worried that she won't be able to connect to her own child. Her sister then takes her to the hospital where they find this lady having a banging headache and everyone starts going crazy because the creatures have arrived. <laughs> Now, some would think it's ridiculous that things would go that crazy that fast, but personally, I don't think it's fast enough. Y'all know good and well that just the thought of a virus would have us killing ourselves in America months before it even spreads over here. So Sandra's sister gets blindsided by a truck. She then gets rescued by this lady who picks the wrong day for a sauna, and a bunch of people then find themselves in B.D. Wong's house like a normal Wednesday in Cali. There's the bitter Douglas who lost his wife and takes these rations a little too seriously, Tom who Sandy falls for in the moonlight, Olympia who shows up with a dumpling of her own, Alita and Machine Gun Kelly who are about to make their own, and Cheryl and Charlie who just mind their own business. But, but it's not one of those kids stories, you know, where they all got crossbows and they're killing each other to survive or running around some giant maze. Uh -huh. BD then brings up his security cameras in hopes of detecting the monsters via heat signature, but because they're worried that it might make him go crazy when he stares at them, they tie him up and leave him alone with his computer in the room. The camera picks up on some wind, which I'll just say, if the design of the creatures is meant for them to be invisible, 
I don't know why we keep seeing shadows for them, but either way, they cause BD Wong to flip out, and that's one down. Charlie then brings up going to the supermarket where he works for supplies, and they come up with the genius idea of mad tinting their windows as they drive using their GPS. But like, didn't we just see a bunch of crashes in the way? They end up using the proximity sensors on the car, which is cool until it turns super creepy, and for some reason, these demons are playing by the same rules of the mist, where they won't break into you to get you, you have to go to them. So luckily they make it to the supermarket where y'all should have set up camp and stayed there. All of us collectively are making the end of the world GREAT AGAIN! After you toss this dude, of course. Charlie ends up sacrificing himself when one of the creatures pulls that stunt the Annihilation Bear did and pretends to be one of his co-workers seeking help. Sandra quickly remembers how the birds were also used to signal them in Arrival and decides to take them since, again, if these are demons, the birds would be able to tell when evil entities are nearby. They return back home, Lucy and Felix steal the car, causing Machine Gun Kelly to probably die for the second time in 2018, and then this random dude named Gary appears. Now, he starts spewing things about how cycles were breaking into his house and they weren't even wearing blindfolds, meaning they were immune to the creatures. Now, you can see that as, you know, them not having fear, so it didn't affect them. But what I do know is that I didn't trust Gary the moment he walked in. He knocks out Trevante, opens the garage door so the creatures can get inside the mind of John Malkovich. But then this dude goes into the room where these two just gave birth, opens up the window killing Olympia, cuts Jackie from the cast, but then luckily Johnny Boy and Trevante come back and take this fool down. Years later, Tom and Mallory are the only survivors with these two kids. One's hers and the other is Olympia's. And they're having this big argument over how to raise the kids. You know, he wants to give them dreams. She don't even want to give them names. Boy, girl. Time for bed. And while they still haven't gotten all their creature questions answered, the only question that I had during this part of the movie was, how is my man still getting enough protein during the apocalypse to keep up with these gains? They make contact with someone over the radio who lets them know about the sanctuary, the saviors, I guess we can call them, then come in trying to get them to look at the creatures so Tom sacrifices himself. And keeping up with the metaphor of raising a five-year-old, Sandra gets hit with these Grand Rapids. 16 hours on the river and they come across this heel-sniffing serial killer from Mindhunters who claims to have seen the creatures who I guess can be a metaphor for the creepers you gotta keep away from your kids. 24 hours on the river and she realizes how lazy kids can be. You stop drawing. <sighs> Take a break. How quickly they lose things. No, 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 all the food and the blankets. God damn it! And how they don't follow directions. <laughs> Told you to stay on the boat! 38 hours on the river and you get the darkest part where Sandra is ready to sacrifice this little girl and make her look for directions. Now I don't know if sacrificing a child is a part of the parenting process, but this little girl looked like an Ewok, so how dare you even think of that? We then get the forest scene, which if I'm being honest, this was the scene I was the most critical about. Like, I know that this is supposed to be the climax where she embraces being a parent, but I don't get why these two split. Yeah, a little girl may have felt a way about it, but these two were raised together, right? They were supposed to be inseparable. They were literally trained to do the exact opposite of what they do in this scene right here. Luckily, Sandra's able to daredevil her way and finds them, rushes through the forest and uses them as bumpers, and then finds the sanctuary that they heard about on the radio. She's okay. They're all okay. Get Rick. Look, I'm not even gonna lie. For a second, I actually thought this was gonna be one of those Walking Dead movie spin-offs, but nah. It ends up being a school for the blind that's also surrounded by birds for security. In the book, this was actually a little bit darker because when she finds the sanctuary, everyone in there purposefully gouged out their eyeballs so they couldn't see. So this is a little bit more of an optimistic ending. They're able to unite with everybody there. Mallory finally gives these kids their names and social security numbers, and the three settle in as they're able to survive another day. But if looking at them makes you want to kill yourself, does that also make this a metaphor for your ex? Thank you guys for checking out this video. I'm curious to know your thoughts down below in the comment section, uh, your theories on the origins and stuff. Like I said, sometimes these movies don't have a specific origin. It's really cool that the screenwriter went out and tried to make his own, and that's the theories that Charlie has. But, uh, you know, I'm one of those where I definitely think the metaphor stands out about parenting and stuff. It's just... It's okay to have both, you know, have a little little origin plot to your movie and then also have the theme stick out. I think that they benefit each other. You don't have to pick one over the other. But curious to know your thoughts about this movie. Uh, any other ones as we get towards the end of the year that you like? 
anything else that's on Netflix, I guess. Uh, and a shout out to Sandra Bullock. I had no idea. Obviously, age isn't important, but I'm just saying, Sandra Bullock looks better now than she did 20 years ago. You know, sometimes the light hits her and she looks a little bit like Teddy Perkins. But other than that, like, this girl is still gorgeous. So I'm curious to know your thoughts down below in the comment section. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe, and I'll send you your very own blindfold.